One of the things which makes modern principles macroeconomics different from other texts is that we analyze monetary and fiscal policy using both real shocks and aggregate demand shocks. And the responses of policy are different depending upon the source of the shock. Let's first of all show what happens with an aggregate demand shock, since that's the more standard approach. Here we begin setting up our long-run dynamic equilibrium with our solo growth curve, our aggregate demand curve, and our short-run aggregate supply curve. Let's suppose that we have a shock to confidence so that our aggregate demand has a private decrease. Well, in the short run, this reduces the growth rate and reduces the inflation rate. In the long run, we might end up at point C, but can we do better? Well, yes. Here's an ideal case for monetary policy. Monetary policy can reverse the shock to aggregate demand, putting us back at point A. The response of the economy, however, to real shocks can be quite different than to aggregate demand shocks. Here is Edmund Phelps, Nobel Prize winner, speaking in the Financial Times in uh, 2008. Phelps says, if employment is down because of aggregate demand, the problem can be addressed at zero cost through rate cuts and the ensuing rise in the money supply. Many central banks like to do that, to lean against the wind. This time, though, some economists instinctively feel that the present downturn is the effect of structural shifts in the economy, not a shift in aggregate demand. They doubt that a central bank should retard effects it cannot prevent. If employment is down because of shifting structures, gearing the money supply to attempt to prop up employment would generate ever-rising inflation. Similarly, here is economist Jim Hamilton speaking on his blog, Econ Browser. Until we once again have a financial sector that can successfully allocate credit to worthy projects, we're not possibly going to be able to produce as much in the way of real goods and services, no matter what the level of aggregate demand or stimulus package might be. In terms of the textbook Keynesian models that people play with, I'm suggesting that potential GDP growth for 2009, quarter one, that growth rate, which, if we try to exceed it by stimulating aggregate demand, we primarily just get more inflation, is in fact a negative number. I do not accept the proposition that there is a level of government spending, however large a number you choose to suggest, that will prevent the unemployment rate from rising above 8%. Now, whether Phelps and Hamilton have correctly described our current recession is certainly a subject of debate. What we want to do, however, is at least be able to show in our model what Hamilton and Nobel Prize winner Phelps are talking about. In modern principles, we can do exactly that. Let's show how. To show how monetary and fiscal policy work differently with real shocks than with aggregate demand shocks, we set up our model just as we did before. Here's our solo growth curve, our old short-run aggregate supply curve, and the aggregate demand curve. So our initial equilibrium is at point A. Except this time, instead of analyzing a shock to aggregate demand, we're going to analyze a negative real shock. That means that the solo growth curve shifts to the left. And we get a new equilibrium at point B. Notice that at point B, we're in a recession. The growth rate is negative 3%. Well, what happens? when monetary policy is applied in this circumstance. Well, just as before, monetary policy will shift out the aggregate demand curve, but this time, we will not return to our old growth rate of 3%. The reason is, is that the solo growth curve has shifted to the left. That means that the potential growth rate of the economy is now lower. So instead of restoring the growth rate to its old level, Primarily what happens is we get a large increase in inflation, exactly as Phelps and Hamilton had suggested. Okay, let's briefly review. The dynamic ADS model provides a natural progression from growth theory to business fluctuations, which are modeled as fluctuations in the growth rate. The model is consistent with the paradigm of modern macroeconomics. In addition, the model is parsimonious, just three curves, 
and accessible to principals of economics students of all levels. A key element which this model recognizes is that not all recessions are alike. Each recession is a combination of different shocks and also different transmission mechanisms, mechanisms which amplify and transmit shocks across the economy. We talk more about these mechanisms in Modern Principles. Monetary and fiscal policy work differently depending upon the type of shock. In the dynamic ADAS model, it's flexible enough to encompass different types of shocks and a sophisticated discussion of fiscal and monetary policy when they work and when they don't. What are their potentials and also what are their limitations? Well, you can find a lot more about modern principles macroeconomics at seetheinvisiblehand.com. Thanks very much for listening.